Welcome to Aircrew Interview, I'm Mike and your host, and in this episode we chat to former South African Air Force pilot Cobus Tureen. In part one, Cobus chats about flying the Mirage F1, what the role of the aircraft was with the Air Force, how it handled, its strengths and weaknesses, DACT, and his role in the Angolian conflict. So if you like what we do here and would like to see more content, you can do this by donating monthly at patreon.com forward slash aircrew interview. Thank you and enjoy. So Corbis, when did you first become interested in aviation? Hey Mike, good morning. Um, good question, because I didn't know. My folks told me many uh, times over and over when I was about three, I think it was the time the, the South African Air Force changed from the Vampire to the Sabre, the F-86. Mm -hmm. And we lived on extension of Waterkloof, Air Force Base Waterkloof. And um, somehow they just, they just scared me. And every time I run into the room, so one of my dad just sat there and said, how are we going to overcome this? I said, I don't know. So, um, and he said, well, we have to think it because think about it. I said, you know, this one, it, it, can I fly that stuff? And he says, well, <laughs> yeah, only three years, but I can't remember that. That's what my folks told me. So from three years and from then on, it was aircraft, aircraft, aircraft. And now many, many moons later, it's still aircraft and aircraft. Brilliant. So, yeah, when did you join the South African Air Force? And can you talk us through some of the uh, aircraft you started training on? It was in um, beginning of, in fact, now we first had to go and do the three-month basic training. Everybody, you know, you get through computer selected. I went to Kimberley to Donitron Combat School in the Army, and I thought, oh, I'm not going to fly. So we started in March 1974 at um, Donato. Well, the old Spammy, the, the Harvard aircraft, the T6G, I think maybe it's more the acronym you will know, and uh, up to 60 hours. And then we went, half a course of us went to Air Force Base Langebaum Weg, where we flew the Impala Mark 1. And um, in 1975, I was awarded my wings. And we just had a chat about it last night by the famous General Bob Rogers. So that was actually quite, quite interesting. Yeah, because the Impala and the Impala have looked at it, and it kind of looks like a bigger Jet Provost. Uh, what was it like to fly? Uh, certainly better than the Jet Provost. <laughs> it's a It's Italian, and and it's so easy to fly. In fact, anything is easy once you get to fly it or get to know it. But it was uh, a good trainer. We enjoyed it. It was hot in Langebaum, so it's uh, very hot in the in um, in the aircraft itself. But it's easy to handle. Um, and then the beauty was when the Mark II version came later on, which is a single seat with the two 30 millimeter cannons. I mean, that was really a nice aircraft to fly. They had hydraulic assistance, but the Mark I was it did well. I mean, it spent many, many uh, years in the Air Force, and uh, I, I really enjoyed that. So, how long did your flying training take? It's practically, let um, me think, it's about a year, and it's up to almost 200 hours, if I recall. So, yeah, that's, I'm just going to work it out. Because we started flying in 74 and we got our wings in 75. So it takes about a full year and of which you built um, in the region of 200 hours for your wings. Brilliant. And then, then, you're, then you move from Puto pilot to a, a pilot, but, you know, pilot in, in soft letters. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we're here to talk about the F1 and the Cheetah, but we're going to start with the beautiful F1. What were your first thoughts on that aircraft? It's a beauty. It's an absolute beauty. And, and um, they have been in the country for quite a while. And during the time we, we first went after I was went studying and then when I was done, um, in the meantime, we flew them, the Impalas. Uh, and I went to H Squadron, which is the Impalas. And from there, I was hoping to get onto the F1s. But um, I was then actually sent to two squadron, which was the old Mirage threes initially. But then I was invited to come to three squadron in Pretoria to fly the F1. And uh, and I never look back. It's such a beautiful aircraft, such a lovely lady to fly. She's potent, she's powerful, and she handles so nicely and so easily. So uh, I think there's only one thing better than the F1, and it might be the Rafale, but I'm not sure. So <laughs> well, I totally agree with you there. So what was the role of the F1 in the South African Air Force? We had the two versions. Um, most of them were the Mirage F1AZ, remember the Z for South Africa, the attack version, and then the CZ, the counter air version. Uh, we had only 16 of them. So the various roles basically was a 2080 split where the AZs would do all the ground attack, 20% air combat, and we did 80% air combat, 20% um, ground attack. So it was a, it could multi roll the aircraft, but I mean the AZ had a Doppler for accurate bombing where we had a, uh, that I say, sorry, no radar, 
for intercepts at night, day night, it's a day night interceptor. So that's basically the roles. And then in, um, we use it mostly for to uh, escort the uh, reconnaissance aircraft, the the buccaneer, so you got the buccaneer in the back, but on very few occasions we went with the bucks because they low and fast, don't have to worry about them, but mostly the Canberras and then also the Mirage 3 RZ, the reconnaissance aircraft. Mm-hmm. And did you as a pilot get to choose which, um, you know, pla- well, not which role uh, the F1 did, the air to ground or air to air, or were you just put, or were you selected for one, or did you get a choice? It was a combination. You were given a choice. You were always given a choice. I would love to go and fly air combat, so, and that's why I was initially earmarked to go to two squadron. We had the Mirage 3C, which is also a counter-attack version, and um, then I was invited to come to three squadron to fly the F1C. So that was my first choice, um, and I did like I'm, I'm going to get my second one when I went back to my first choice. And ironically, years later, I did go back to two squadron. So I act like I had all my choices. Going <laughs> Lucky man. But uh, can yeah. we talk a bit about your ground training? And yeah, was it quite intense on the F1? Yes, because um, when you get into the F1, your first solo is just that's your first flight because it's a single seater. But having come from about 80 hours on the Mirage 3, we flew the EZ, the D, and the D2s. Um, we did weaponry, we did air combat, we did air to air fighting. So it was quite intense 80 hours, the six month course on the Mirage course, which prepared us well to get onto the F1, which is in fact easier to fly than the Mirage 3. But then we had a static simulator, and that we were pushed into, of course, all the, the ground subjects, hydraulics, electrics, and all that stuff. We had to finish first, then the simulator. And then when we uh, climbed into the F1, I mean, actually, we just felt at home. I mean, that smell is the same, the Mirage smell. It's lovely. Um, and it was quite easy to adapt. And then we, from there, we, we went further. We also, of course, with air combat, starting with 1v1, 2v1s, go up to 4v4s eventually. Um, and then also air to ground, where we did rockets, mostly some bombing. I was a very bad bomber pilot. Um, my, my favorite in bombing was the ski bombing, which you fly at 50 foot um, to deliver that. Um, so, yes, the training was intense. But, I mean, with the, the I think years through the Impalas and then the 80 hours that, that course on Petersburg, with the Mirage at sea actually prepared us to get into the F1 quicker than what I thought we would. Can you remember your first flight in the F1? Oh, yes. Yeah, you'll never forget that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, with, um, uh, what we have when you go your solo, it was uh, in two, uh, 215 was the number. I can remember the date. I'll have to look wow. up. But it was in 81. Um, and then you get, you, you do your preparations, you climb in, you do preparations. But there's another pilot that shows you the pre-flight, goes through it, and he's connected uh, onto you in case there's a small snack or a snack of business or you want, you have any questions. So when the engine started, and I said to him, wow. He says, what, what, why are you hesitating? I said, just want to get rid of this little shiver. He says, are you scared? <laughs> said, no, I'm so excited. And uh, taxied out. What was lovely is that for the first time in my, my life, I had a nose wheel steering. I had nose wheel steering. You know, yeah. it was just the finesse rather than it had slats and flaps. It did a lot of things that's lovely. And then the takeoff was just amazing. I um, nearly forgot to raise the flaps because now you've flown the deltas. But at least there's something that warns you and uh, pick up the flats and go out and do the aerobatics and come back in there. I was fine because over the, the uh, coming on to initial, I did a, a straight roll. And the uh, officer Kulmani was not too impressed with that. He said, yeah, we are, we'd like to have fighter pilots in the squadron, but for your first flight doing a straight roll, and I was fined uh, one degree, one rand per degree. So I was fined 365 rand. Because <laughs> <they said, laughs> that's fine. Was it worth so it? Was, yeah, and then um, then we had a function afterwards. At this, oh, yeah, I'll never forget. And I had a very good friend of mine. He's passed away in the UN. Ackerman, who was with me, so the two of us did the course together and we went solo on the same day. Oh, brilliant. And could you feel that power with that reheat in or afterburner? Yes. Um, yeah, look, you can always feel that. But from the Mirage 3 at Petersburg, which is at a lower altitude, there wasn't much difference. Uh, although they had the old engine, we now had the 9K50, so it was a bit of a, a, a kick, a bit of a more kick, even at altitude. Yeah, you know, yeah, I'm very close to Warwickville. Uh, it's 5,500 feet. But yeah, I've always, I mean, I think it's always the nicest feeling when you let go of the brakes and you just slam it open. Until I flew in the in the Mirage 2000 and in the Sukhoi, I thought, <clears throat> yeah, it's not that much. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, Corbus, can you talk us through some of your flying training in the F1? Like what sort of things would you be doing? 
basically we uh, we tried to fly and we did. We flew Mondays, Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays, so two to three okay. flights a day. With air combat, it was very intensive. Um, we went through uh, phases, you know, then, for instance, it's the air combat phase, and we went through one we once, we build up and build up and build up and fly and fly. And that was what made us good, is because we flew so much. I, I flew 500 hours on my, my first year tour, wow. which was a lot. I think the sorties are practically 30 minutes. Then we would go and do a lab navigation, low level navigation, go into the air to ground mode where we would go to a uh, of the bombing range close to Petersburg and do some bombing. Um, and sometimes we deploy to Bloemfontein. We used to go there to Bloomsplate um, and the vet, was it the vet or the Brook, the vet bombing range, and go and do rockets and uh, profiles. You know, uh, we have, especially with bombing, we never did rockets in the in the Angolan conflict, but we, we were tagged on behind the AZ sometimes to make a 16 ship formation uh, with bombing. It's actually. Obviously, you now when you're number 16, by the time you're rolling there, the ACA guys are fairly well exercised. But that's basically how the training went through Cyprus. And, and then we'd also incorporate, um, which is the nicest trip we could do, is air to air gunnery at um, Air Force Base Langebon Weg down at the coast there where the Impalos were. We had our own hangar and, and old hang, our own hangar and every setup is there. And then also later on, starting with missile fire, which oh, wow. was, that was, oh, that was the, that was the, the loveliest of them all. Yeah, so let's talk a bit about the missiles. Um, what what would the, uh, the F-1 be carrying at this time? At, at the time, we had the uh, French Matra 550 infrared, um, and uh, that was basically the only missile we had at the time. And it evolved as the war was going on, the conflict in Angola, I don't want to call it a war. Um, and, and it evolved into, for instance, the V-3Bs. Locally, we started building own missiles, but we never carried them in the conflict um, ourselves, we had the uh, Matra 550. But later on, we had some of the V3Bs put on and we also fired them. But by that, it was in 88, somewhere there, and that's when the conflict ended. Mm. And then later also we had, which was the beauty, was uh, um, the V3S snake, as we call it. Yeah. Uh, a python, softly said. Um, is uh, a head-on sector V3, uh, a head-on sector infrared. It's a huge missile. That was lovely. So we got to fire that as well. And then also what we did is uh, we had, apart from the air to air, it's usually a flat toe binding parlor. And then we had what we call the tax end. It was a sick up, up and then a tax end that you was, it was towed by ourselves. We tow it and it's quite far behind. You can fly a figure eight. So you had to maneuver to shoot it, you know, to get, make it more realistic. Mm -hmm. But for the Python, because it's a head on, we had a Learjet that pulled a, a flare quite far back. Quite far back. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, yeah. <laughs> and incidentally, the, the Learjet pilots were X3 squadron as well. Oh, wow. They went to fly for another company. Um, and then you, you fire that. And it's quite scary for the poor Learjet guy because you can see you fire the missile and it's just up, the missile will go to the back. So to me, that was the, the best of the best. Uh, yeah, I think it's very rare pilots get to fire live missiles for sure. Yes, I must mention, we also had the air-to-surface missile, that, um, no, sorry, air-to-air -air missile, the a 3 uh, uh, A530, which was a huge missile. Some of the photographs you'll see it's at the belly, but I almost forgot about it because we, we never carried it. We were not allowed to fire it. They were actually Timex. We never used it. It was okay. used when the F1 came in. It's a long range uh, air to air missile um, using the radar um, when you go to uh, for intercepts. And unfortunately, it, it came timing, so we, ne we never got to use that. We said, ask them, so nice, I said, please, you've got all these missiles. Can't we go and fire them there long about open into the sea? We'll clear the area. We'll make sure it's safe, everything. No, I just said, no, the risk is too high. You never know what the thing is going to do. Right. And it, with, with uh, uh, missile training, also in the Impalos at the stage at Petersburg, we had, I forgot the name. It's a little a missile that you can control. And it was actually training for, doesn't matter where you're going to go and fly, Buccaneers or what, uh, to, it's a hand control in the cockpit. Okay. And this thing was kind of just line up the lights, the, the flare behind the missile uh, with the target onto the sea. Now that I remember that. But that was with the Impala to give you that, that type of um, um, experience. And I remember one or two of these, they would fire, they would go and they'd go right out of the aircraft towards the back somewhere. <laughs> with all the behind it. <laughs> but uh, I think that was more in preparation, preparation for the Buccaneer guys and um, the TV-guided bombs and things we had later, which was all locally produced. 
Brilliant. Well, that's fascinating there, um, Corbis. But I want to talk about one of our uh, favourite subjects on the channel and our viewers is DACT. So how did the F1 fare against, you know, uh, did it go up against the Cheetah, the Mirages, or even any other foreign uh, aircraft? That, that was part of the training. We had uh, at least once a year annually, we had a big uh, air, air combat manoeuvring camp. And at could be, sorry, I just want to close the dog here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Because he doesn't understand that I'm talking, but I'm not talking to him. <laughs> so we had, um, in, in the training was also this intermix with air combat training, where we'd have the, uh, I remember at Uppington in the early years, we had the Impalas with the Impala squadrons. We had the um, F1, AZ, CZ, so one and three squadron. And we also had then, was it five squadron, at the Cheetah E, and 89 combat flying school had the Cheetah D. And then uh, once a year, annual year, but June, July, we also had the, uh, the supersonic camp in Durban, where we did um, what we call supersonic ACM. But you can fly out over the sea 30 miles away, and we, you know, you don't worry about your speed. You fly in the hard deck. It's usually at 12,000. We can bring it back down to 3,000 feet. So one has to be very careful. You don't sit in a supersonic dive. Um, so you can see the, the training was very intense, and we had these annual camps. But it was so nice. I mean, we had a lot of fighting with the Impalas because if you want to bring your speed down, and especially in the Delta, and you bring your speed down, that Impala yeah. is going to catch you. Oh, yeah. Um, so it was lovely. And I remember I've got a picture somewhere where we had 49 Mirage Cheetahs on the apron in Uppington. I mean, wow. And there must have been 49 combat ready pilots as well. And, and of course, then we also, the evenings was a, a little bit, uh, you know, not rough, but, but very enjoyable. <laughs> Brilliant stuff. And yeah, you mentioned the Angola conflict there. We're going to get onto that. But I also noticed that you flew on the airshow scene with the F1. Can you tell us about that? Yes, but sorry, if I can come back quickly, you asked me as well what other aircraft types. We also had uh, the privilege to fly against the Mirage 2000-5, which was here for the, during the arms trade in 1995. Yeah. So exercise against her. And, um, and then we also had the Sukhoi 30 and the Sukhoi 32 which we also flew against, and with tactics and everything. And a guy like Viktor Pukachev, I flew with him in the front seat. So we had that exposure, which was which was lovely. And when I left the squadron, the tornadoes, they, remember when Thorogood asked, Al Thoros asked if he can come and visit, they can come and visit um, Louis Trichat. They did. Unfortunately, I was I left the squadron by then. So they flew against the tornadoes, and they flew against the F-15s from USA. Oh, wow. F-15s came here. I was so sad because now, now I'm flying... Um, Big steady aircraft in the airline, and these guys are fighting with the F-15s. Uh, and we actually did quite well. I mean, you can't compare an F-15 with a, with a cheetah. But anyway, no. sorry, just back to that that question. So we, we had a lot of uh, dissimilar training. Um, air shows. Oh, that is maybe one of my other favourites. You were given the chance and opportunity um, at um, at the squadron to become a, a display pilot. Obviously, I'm um, number one. You must be interested to do it. Not you not know, everybody. And amazing, you think that every fighter pilot really wants to do it. And then um, there's some training. We initially started with the Impala, maybe, and then do some low-level aerobatics, and then with the F1. And the F1 was actually very nice and easy to fly because it had uh, slats and flap, and what we call the combat flap, which was quite nice. You, you're not allowed to use it during air displays. Obviously, obviously we didn't, of course. <laughs> but it was lovely. It will help you to – the slats will come out once you go below seven or above 7 degree incidence. The flaps will go out below 350 knots, and once you accelerate, it will all go, all go in by itself. Mm -hmm. So the F1 was really nice um, to fly. The Cheetah I enjoyed as well. Um, we just displays in the Cheetah C, although um, in the Cheetah I did more displays with with um, the painted Cheetah, with the spotty, we did a, a low-level 2v1 display. First, we um, air, air to air feeling, um, which we didn't pluck, just purely because of the turbulence. You know, you don't want yeah. to damage it. Show, but to the people to get the idea with the Boeing's low level with three cheetahs behind, and it will do a mock 2v1 uh, with wow. the cheetah. Unfortunately, with the cheetah, see, we'll get to the cheetahs later, but um, I mean, and up this altitude, you know, you, once you pull off all the speed because it had mm, cannots, and yeah, you have a bit of a problem. You have to go and buy buttons, we call uh, speed and not buttons, um, to, to go and get that back. But yeah, air display, I, I really, really enjoyed it. And at the stage, we did a many, many shows as well. Yeah, I'm surprised you said that. Yeah, because I thought most uh, fighter pilots would jump at the chance to, you know, be a display pilot. I would think most of them wanted to, you know, but um, 
somehow, you know, only one can do it, and it was usually given to the younger guys as well. So if you take over the squad, and most probably half of them who had the opportunity to do that, and the other half, you know, only one or two can do it, and they actually stood back. I'm just saying, maybe, I'm not saying they never wanted to do it. I think they just, if there's really somebody that so much love to do it, I'd rather give it to them. Yeah. So um, I was fortunate to do that. Corbis, you were also involved in the Angola conflict. Can you tell me about this? Yes, I suppose it's every fighter pilot's dream to be involved in some conflict of some sort, you know. But um, when you get older, you, then you realize, you know, they always say uh, war is not about who is right, but what is left. But the Angolan conflict carried on for quite a few years, and I started off the Impala and the Impala Mark II, and we usually carried um, the 30 millimeter cannons, and we had four rocket pots, the 68 millimeter snaps. And we did low-level reconnaissance most of the time to see where the tracks of the vehicles coming in and where they were. But initially, we were not allowed to, um, we called it the cut line, and, and we're not really allowed to cross the cut line. The cut line is the border between Southwest Africa at that time, now Namibia and in And I was part of a formation that actually the first time we did fire and did go across the cut line uh, is when we realized that usually when there's an infiltration they build a cache, uh, arms cachets, just next to the, close to the border, because they know we're not allowed to go across the border at the time, with, with the impalance anyway. Yeah. And we could see this, and uh, the leader just decided, listen, it just, you can see the, 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 there were no people there, but somehow it, it looked like there was a cache, if I can use that word. And he fired a few rockets in it, and there was a big explosion. Oh. So then, of course, all four of us climbed in, and we took out that whole arms cache. Obviously, flying back, we said, <clears throat> did anybody cross the border? No, 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 no. No, we didn't. Um, and, in fact, you can't fire across the border. With the, the Yati Strip was about, a, I can't remember, it's about 500 meters no man's land. Right. But eventually, uh, uh, yep, uh, the leader was uh, taken to task. In a sense, he was just asked, but we're not allowed to sit. But this arms cache, I mean, the guys will infiltrate the next day. You know? So, yeah. All is forgiven. I mean, in a conflict, you don't um, win a war, but or win a conflict or win any fight by watching the other guy taking you out. Of course. Yeah. Then um, it accelerated. The whole conflict accelerated so quickly, and um, eventually, then we, the, the, it became deeper and deeper. And, and, and um, I spent quite a few um, sorties with the Impala. We did ground attacks on, on camps. I mean, a camp's about two kilometers by two kilometers, so you have to pinpoint targets. From there, I um, when, when I, t I left, I did an instructor's course, and then I went back, and then I went to, oh, sorry, then I first went to the Mirage course on the F1s, and then on the F1s, uh, going into the um, operational area, we were usually stationed, even the Impala stationed at Ondangwa, which is still there today. The other bases were Rundu and Mapacha, but um, um, Ems, we also went to Mapacha, Seldom and Rundu. Rundu was in the, in the middle. It's mostly where the choppers were, although they were at Dondangwa. And then uh, your cameras and buccaneers would operate from Krutfontein. It was based Krutfontein, which is a bit further south. Long runway and um, a huge army camp as well, but a huge runway, especially for the, the buccaneers and the cameras when they're heavily loaded, uh, to have runway space. Dondangwa's runway wasn't that long. I think it was about 8,000 feet lighter. It was made only much lighter to 10,000 feet. Um, and then escorting the, the buccaneers, uh, not the buccaneers really, um, we trained with the buccaneers, but they, they could fly on their own and look, they couldn't protect themselves, but I mean, they can run low level and run away from anything. But yeah, the poor Canberras couldn't. Um, so our biggest role was the escort role with the Canberras. Mm -hmm. But the Impala flying was actually wonderful because it was low level all the time. And you know, it's flat area. So you have to know very well where's north and south because there's no there was an indie beard or dango, that's about it. And because it's so flat, you eventually learned that there's a tree sticking out, you know where you are. Mm -hmm. And the further you move to the north, uh, Vangala, of course, becomes more and more mountainous. Mm -hmm. But it was uh, for a youngster, living conditions, of course, is not always that great. First tents and then we had terrapins in that heat and when the, uh, the rains come down. But we just made it fun. I mean, we made the best of it. Mm -hmm. And could you talk us through the MiG-21 shoot-down? Uh, yes, that, that was another highlight, I think, in my career, and a downlight in the sense I didn't get to shoot anything. But very shortly, it was one of those sorties where the two cameras were taking off from Kruitfontein. Uh, we would start it on Dangwa and start taxiing out and wait at the runway, and when they pass overhead low level, um, we would take off and then catch up. With, we, we said the camera can't pitch. 
it can only climb. Mm-hmm. So we wait till they start climbing, and then we pitch up, get on the top, and basically um, it's just to, to um, wait for them to come and level. They were doing uh, photo reconnaissance in the southern parts, the Kahama area. And that particular day, um, I remember the aircraft was 209, and the leader was Johan Rank, and he was in 203, 203. The first one was painted in the blue colors. And my aircraft wouldn't start. And I wasn't going to give my sortie away to somebody else that's yeah. jumping in the aircraft. But sometimes in that heat, especially in the, in the dust and sand, we had a double. But eventually it did start. Bottom line is we were slightly late. So we took off and ran up, and the buccaneers said, well, they're going to carry on when they heard we're coming. Um, and they started the photo reconnaissance. And then as we got into the area, our mission controller started saying, there's, there's activity, there's activity, there's uh, deltas. And... Um, the cameras were deciding, well, what are we going to do now? And the camera is the only aircraft I know when it disengages, it can climb and out climbs them. We did a lot of air combat training with them. You can't, you can't get them unless you have a good missile. So the bottom line is they decided to, to plunge and go level over and, and abort the mission. And I think it all happened because on the radar picture, they couldn't see the, the fighter escort because we weren't there. And they decided to attack the, the cameras. Um, we were then heading towards the north. I was sitting on the right-hand side on the, on the right beam, flying a beam. It's our normal um, combat formation, and you one on the left-hand beam. And that day, I think, was the 8th of October, 1982. I recall. Oh, the dates. Bottom line is uh, we heard them coming, and they were – and their heights, we were at about 30,000 feet um, – and point nine, and when the mission controllers uh, said, you know, you said bogeys are unidentified aircraft, and then we said, no, bandits, those were definitely mixed coming in. Mm. And there's another pair that's behind, but they were quite far behind, because that's a Russian doctor, Russian, two pair, a pair in the front and a pair in the back. Mm-hmm. And uh, we said, okay, but we're on the very edge of our own radar at that time. So, you know, unfortunately, the poor radar mission controller, had to battle to see them, but he saw them as they, as they climbed and climbed, and they most probably were going to go after the cameras. And then all of a sudden, yes, two F1s, two fighters, and well, they were committed. <laughs> anyway, they, they, act, they were so accurate in their mission control that when it was five miles, Johan was sitting on my left, he shouted, We job at uh, jettisoned the tanks, which we did the petty tanks, we jettisoned them. And he said, they, and, and, and um, he picked them up, and they were going to pass on my right and said, Then you're if you're on the right hand side, usually you, you look towards the front and the back, that's your, that's your cover. This is the other way around. So we cover, you don't look after your own side, you look after his side. And when I looked up, they were so close, in, in a close formation, that I could see the white helmets down in the cockpit. And I couldn't wow. understand it. Yeah, but so close. I mean, you, you could see though, I mean, that. You know, it, it numbed me for a second. You know, I was going to love to see a mic, but not that close. No, of course. <laughs> anyway, but Ryan was turning already. I'll try and make it short. And then when I turned, I was actually thrown outside of the front. And these guys were so close to each other. But now the problem was that other pair is behind. We turned because they were quite far behind. The Russian doctor is not further than five. And then you must be careful where you turn. Bottom line is it was open and we turned. And amazingly... Um, Turning around, you honored them. He was going after them all the time, and I was trying to play catch up here. But the next moment, he, he also shouted, I can't remember the thing, I still got the tape somewhere, and uh, from the Canberra's tape, the whole the, this ex, uh, the conversation. And I said, but they're firing their missiles. It looked like they were firing their missiles. Wow. I said, okay, then they don't have missiles, so yeah, because that was soon after the cross. Um, and then as we're trying to catch it, the next moment, something like, like a pin, a big pin came floating. And I had to actually turn to, now we're doing Mach 1.1, I think, at 30,000 feet. And they were, they were supersonic as well. So that was a supersonic cross. And, um, okay, now watching the fuel, watching the fuel. But we knew they had less fuel than us because the, the MiG-21 just got less fuel than the F1. But a long story short is that when one eventually um, – Fired his missile, that was a, a Matra 550. It, 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 it did, you could see there was locked, but it wasn't very, very steady. Now, sorry, the first one just it didn't lock, so but he was too far in the anxiety. That, and that just is his second MIG interception. He had one a year before where he shot down one MIG. So um, then the, that missile just went astray. Now, in the meantime, the mission controller and I'm talking, and look, I have to look behind and see where if I could see the mix. And he couldn't give. A distance or a height because he was uh, in our in, in red radar for us. 
He could, he could only hear they're coming and he's got more or less a plot, but he couldn't physically see them on the radar. So that was my job, you know, looking at the back whilst trying to catch up. And then you once shot the, um, the next um, Matra 550 and that you could see it battled and it went. It went all the way up to the guy in the behind. They were quite close like that. And then number two, it exploded about 70 meters. Now later on, we, may, we used with a gun camera film, we could see seven meters, he had exploded. So, and it had picked up quite a bit of damage and I'll, I'll tell you why we know. But the next moment, it just did a split S, and this guy, the thing is they reversed as well, and we don't know why they reversed, and that's actually why we could catch up. But I was still about 1,500 meters behind and watching all this, and I looked back, and as I looked back, that guy was gone. I couldn't see him, and I said, oh, you are, I'll come back to you, and he was chasing the other mech, and I was, he only got the 30 millimeter cannons, and I mean, there's nothing wrong with the 30 millimeter cannon, the two of them, and he fired so close. Um, and he hit the mic, um, if I can show with my hand, on the left wing, right? It, it went in here, and it hit and exploded. And it exploded on the gun camera film. I think you've seen it. It was so yeah. huge. The I got a fright. And the next moment I saw Johan's aircraft fly through all this, I could see the mic pitching up, this thick black snug pitching up. And Johan, um, his aircraft was it was burning. But it's actually all the, <laughs> you know, all the, the, uh, the pieces and shrapnel went over his aircraft. And he, I heard over his voice, and I still today said, I'm going down. Now, that's not the words you want to hear. No. And, and, and I laughed that guy off. And, and he said, no, he had a, I was tra- trying to track him because I was still 1,500 meters and 90 degrees off, so there's no way I could actually get him. But that thick black smoke. And your aunt actually meant that he had a compressor store through all the stuff that went through the engine. Wow. But that's not what I heard. But anyway, and, and eventually trying to find him, and I couldn't see him. The mix are on their way. And the next moment I look up, and on my right, he has an aircraft pitching up. I said, is it you pitching up? Because at distance, F1 and me looks the same. He says, yeah, get on the beam. I said, yeah, okay. So I got on the beam. So that that was the, that took six minutes, that whole uh, fight. And we low in fuel, but we flew back. In the meantime, the cameras were running home, chirping on that, which was on the tape recorder. But incidentally, and, and, and what I would like to say about this, that why we still talk about it today, we have contact with those pilots. Oh, and so the MiG-21 he shot down in the first, uh, a year before, I think it was the 4th of, no, it was the 6th of in November in 81. Mm-hmm. And this was the 4th of October, 82. And we said, we come to the bush again, the 4th of September, 83, he doesn't fly. Was he, hey, can you, back, maybe a year later, and he was there at the right place at the right time. And that aircraft was shot down. And then later on also, um, uh, we, through, uh, it's much later, it's only just recently, uh, one of our um, ex Air Force, also ex SAA guys, is starting writing a book about the, the involvement of the Cubans in the Angolan conflict. Mm. And he met up with a guy who's, and we'll try not to use names, I mean, Cubans won't be too happy about it. The, the guys that he flew with against the first one, um, some of the guys defected to America, but these guys that we flew against are still in Cuba. And somehow we got their version and we put our version in the two stories. And uh, the, 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 the stories that, that uh, um, was put together, you look at my, uh, our story and their story, and it's like that. It's like a puzzle. Oh, and it's amazing. Right. And, and, and the questions we had was answered by them, and, and the questions they had was answered by us, not, not by communicating directly, but the two reports. It's amazing. When that book comes out, I'll, I must give you a call. And then we realized that it wasn't the missiles they fired. It was actually the fuel tanks. They also um, jettisoned their fuel tanks. And that's what it looked like. And similarly, they thought we fired missiles, but we, we, we jettisoned our tanks five minutes, five miles before the cross. Theirs were actually only after the cross. The reason it looked like they were sitting with their helmets in the cockpit, the ergonom- uh, ergonom- what's the ergonomics of a cockpit in the MiG is not that great. You had to push here and look there, and, and that's just what they told us. So it was not a matter of just pushing and the tanks are gone. And that's why they had to look down, make sure they don't jettison the, the, the missiles. So it's amazing. Then the, the guy that went back, First, uh, they made it in fuel. We thought they're not going to make it in fuel. And he had uh, the aircraft was at shrapnel. It was at uh, the proximity fuse of the missile that, that caused the, the shrapnel. The other aircraft was damaged. It ran off the runway, but the guy managed to get it. And both guys are fine and alive from the well. And um, amazingly, that aircraft was, it took about a year to fix. It. And I'm not sure it ever flew again, but they tried to fix it. Uh, it had a big hole and, and in the just behind the the wing. Um, and one thing we didn't know about the Mac, you know, the F1 has got two separate fuel systems. You can use a cross feed to transfer the fuel mm-hmm. in case you get shot on this side. How to to get as much fuel out, and then just to make sure you don't lose all your fuel. 
The mix had an even better system. Their tanks sealed. So this tank that was shot, you know, the aircraft sealed it off. So only that fuel went out, and that was out in the explosion. Mm. That big smoke was made probably be because of, we thought it was the engine. But um, the guy said, the, the pilot said, he, it was so big the hole, he could stand up inside the aircraft. But it was when once they picked it up. So imagine you went behind, uh, after war and you go and talk to the pilots because it doesn't never go about the person. And we have communications with him, uh, which is great. And the one Cuban guy came out, he flew MiG-23s, and he shot missiles on the C-130s. And um, he, we, the guys flew him out here, and we had a meeting with him. And the two C-130 crews, practically all of them were there. The afternoon I was invited as well. And the next day we had a fight to meet that it was based by the And uh, he came there, and he still had the map where he plotted he's going to uh, I said, well, that's amazing. And then he realized, you know, these guys, um, they were also thrown into a, a conflict that had actually nothing to do with them. But, I mean, that's what you sign up for once you're, you're, you're a soldier. So then you go. And it was so nice to exchange. I still got my 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 Cuban wings here, yeah, and I got a, a nice coffee mug that says Boer Pilot. You know, Boer uh, Farmer, Burki, they call us Burkis. Yeah. Boer Pilot. So that, that's that's the good after the bad. You know? so, um, and it's so nice to, to, to have communications with them. Yeah, I mean, that's an incredible story. And yeah, it kind of has like a sort of, if you know, I mean, happy ending. You, you're in contact with both uh, um, crews and stuff like that. And yeah, there's communication there. And it's great. And I mean, that book, when it does come out, I'm sure I'll have to give that a read because it sounds fascinating. Yes, he did a lot of studies because there were a lot of um, interactions as well with the Impala shooting down some of the um, uh, MI24s, MI8s. So all those stories are in there. And uh, I'm sure I'm, I, I I'm not sure he's, he's busy with conversions and stuff, so he, he's just in the, in the last phases of finishing the book. And the detail that he went into, and the, the, um, um, incidentally, the, the um, spotty aircraft with the painted cheetah, that guy, the Sean Thackeray, that helped with the design of it, he actually did a lot of the paintings as well oh, wow. um, in that book. And so is um, Rainer so yeah, so he's an artist as well. We were very good friends. Um, also, a lot of paintings. So this book is going to be really something. And it's so nice to see you know, people in war. And of course, we in the Gardens are big mates. Uh, soon after that, when I started flying at the airline, you know, we, we flew to Angola lots, Luanda's. Mm -hmm. So I said, I never went to Luanda. It was just too far. But, you know, that's it. It's a conflict. It's over. And we carry on with our lives. And we become good friends. So, Corpus, how would you sum up the, the Mirage F1? That's a beauty. That's perfect. <laughs> it's, it's, it's such a lovely aircraft to fly. Um, some of our friends like Martin Lowe and Yamini and them, they, they, they flew later on as well. After I was, yeah, something else I can mention maybe when the, the squadron closed down, we did a formation, um, five pass, there were nine aircraft, all serviceable, and nine pilots. Well, I was at Air uh, Force headquarters at the time, but you, you still fly at the squadron. And then um, the last form of flight, and I looked at the pictures last night, is um, in 209, which was my aircraft I had in the, in the, oh, in the, mix, uh, in the mix session. And we, um, the laying down of the colors is quite a parade and has to be in church. It's quite, it's a tradition. And it's a sad day, but because I wasn't in the squad, I was asked to go fly in the formation, just a two ship, and really mess on myself. Uh, the picture behind it's him flying. Okay. Um, and, 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 and we did the last two. Uh, for, for well, formal flight, if I can call it, and landed. Then afterwards, um, Martin and the guys were very involved in, in developing missiles, and some of the aircraft were kept here for development purposes. Um, but unfortunately, um, none of them flying here anymore. So it's all over. I made a list of where all these aircraft are in museums and on a pole here and there. But it was such a lovely aircraft to fly.